in the next 50 minutes or so, I'd like to talk about uh, how we migrate from one cloud provider to another. I am Michele Orselli. I work, I'm from Italy, and I work for a company which is called Ideato. Uh, we are a software agency, basically, so we help our clients um, turning their ideas into projects and products. Uh, these are my contacts, so feel free to get in touch with me after this presentation or by email, Twitter, whatever. Okay, so I'll start with a little story about how we took an 8 years old code base, which started causing a lot of problems and wasting a lot of money for our clients, and started showing increasing stability problems and performance problems, and how we migrated it to well, a more suitable and stable platform. And in the end, everyone was happy. Let's start from the beginning. As I said before, I'm, Itali I'm Italian, so apologies for my bad accent. And if I start moving hands in that way, that's perfectly fine. I'm fine. Don't worry about that, OK? If I fall asleep or fall unconscious, OK, in that case, I'm not fine. Help me. But what do we Italians like? That's a pretty simple question. Want to try to answer? Spaghetti. Yeah, for sure. La pizza. Yeah. La mama, mommy. May, maybe not that particular one, but yeah. Yeah, that or, um, all of these answers are perfectly fine, but there is another thing we like, we enjoy. Football, OK? You should know who this person is, yeah? <laughs> and yeah, our clients basically um, have a site talking about transfer market. You know, if the player X is going to play for uh, Napoli, Naples, or Higuain moved from Naples to Juventus, and stuff like that. We got crazy about this stuff, okay? Our government, our government can raise taxes, lie to us, but we are fine as long as we can watch football. In this particular case, um, traffic were not really, really big, but there were some important numbers. We experienced some peaks during the year, in particular in January, June, August, when the transfer market is held, and also we have some spikes during particular matches, big matches, or Champions League matches, and stuff like that. All the infrastructure, all the sites, were hosted on uh, Rackspace Cloud sites. How many of you do you know about that? Have ever heard about that? Okay, a few, good. Which, in the cloud pyramid, we can put it here, okay, is a platform as a service. What does it mean? Well, it means that you don't have to configure basically anything, almost anything. You push the, co the code into the cloud and you're done. So from the developer, from the uh, Ops point of view, you have a black box, okay? You just put the code, you actually can change a few parameters, but not that much and you are done. Unfortunately, there are some kind of limitation, like some hard limits or on resource usage, like you cannot have more than 50 database connection, con concurrent database connection. You can deploy only through FTP, which, well, in 2006, when we started the migration, was not really fine. And uh, 
you deploy on a shared NFS folder directory, which also means that sometimes during deploys, the Symfony, because I'll, I'll show you later, we are talking about all Symfony application, the Symfony cache got messed for, I don't know, no particular reason, and the site crashed. Good. Uh, also, we didn't have access to real-time logs, like access log, um, slow query logs from MySQL, and stuff like that. And we cannot uh, SSH enter in the machines. Yeah, because, OK, it's a platform as a service. We are not supposed to do that kind of stuff. Also, we were still on PHP 5.3, which, uh, again, was not that good. And uh, let me spend a few words on all the sites that made up the platform. The first one was, is actually, the website, which contains all the articles, all the categories, all the custom pages for the teams, basically everything, almost everything, okay? And it was also the oldest site developed in Symfony 1. After that, we have mobile, which is a customized version, is a custom application for mobile devices. And again, we have all article, categories, themes, details, in a different format. Okay, we didn't have a, any kind of responsive design, stuff like that. And it was a like freestyle project, uh, Symfony 2 components, but no Silex, no framework, just components put together. And, well, it, it is a small application, a bit messy. After that, we have a community site. Uh, well, Vivo per lei in Italiano means high live for her, which means for my team. It's a bit exaggerated maybe, but it gets you the idea. Basically, in this site, people can write their own content. Okay, if a team uh, lose the last match, I can write here that I'm angry, and other people can talk with me, complaining and fighting, basically. So user-generated content. Okay, again, it's a Symfony 2 application. Then we have some sort of microservices for, uh, well, particular task features. And when I say microservices, I have something like this in mind. Micro, not that micro, to be honest, okay. Um, they were more micro, macro services. The first one is talk. Uh, it's a set of API for dealing with comments, votes, ratings, and stuff like that. And is used through all, all the application. Okay. This is a snapshot of uh, uh, the web application. Okay, so we can see here the user comments, votes, the capability to answer a comment or to post a new one. And the same goes for the mobile site. Here we are saying the number of the comments, votes, and stuff like that. Then we have ADV, which is a set of API for serving banners, basically. And again, they are used both in mobile site and in the website. Here is the mobile one, and here you have banners served in the website. Last but not, not least, media. Media is a service used to deal um, to all the assets, okay? Images, both user-generated and editorial images, okay? And to allow to process this kind of images like uh, cropping, uh, resizing, and doing that kind of operations. Okay, again, Symfony 2. Here is an example of, uh, actually a picture of how all the parts of this platform interact together. Basically, here we have the macro services, each with its own database. Then we have a community site, mobile site, and website, which are the facing, public-facing sites. 
In front of that, we, we have Amazon CloudFront, which is a distributed cache for those of you who don't know. And yeah, this proxy basically is used to, well, to allow mobile sites to call these microservices. Mobile doesn't know about these services. Web, in that case, works also as a, well, an orchestrator. OK, so here is where we started. The first problem began, started with the talk application in particular. Okay. Um, during some big matches or, uh, well, during peaks of traffic, uh, the application started to uh, error and basically the user cannot post or read comments and they start blaming us because they thought they were banning them in some sort of way of moderating them, okay? So we tried to find a quick solution. Uh, the first one was, well, tuning the HTTP response headers and caching more endpoints and optimized queries. Uh, the first one was the quickest solution we can came up. Then using the log from uh, CloudFront, we found what were the most hit endpoint and we started caching. Well, it's, and basically we started putting a snippet of code like this in our application, okay. Okay, so this was a temporary solution, but it gave us some time to think about it and how to, uh, well, came up with a more complete solution. And basically, we didn't think too much of a, a plan, a really detailed plan, but the idea was, yeah, we cannot um, use this infrastructure anymore. We need to migrate to another one, to another platform. And in particular, we need to migrate from a platform as a service to infrastructure as a service because we need more control on what's happening, okay? So when something, something, eh, sorry, something goes wrong, we can just, well, try to understand what's wrong and fix it. Okay, uh, we evaluated different solution, and in the end, uh, we decided to migrate to Amazon Web Services because we got good experience of that, and also part of the infrastructure wor was already on AWS, in particular the cloud from distributions. As I said before, the first candidate from, for migration was the talk application. Okay, so la we laid out a possible architecture. Uh, I'm not sure you can read this, but I'm going to explain it for you. Here we have a cloud from distribution for static and dynamic content caching. Then we have an elastic load balancer which uh, accept requests and decide to which web servers direct every request. And then we have two front-end servers in two different um, availability zones. Every front-end web servers contains Nginx and PHP. And then we have the database on RDS, which is the service, the relational database service for Amazon, and a main cache hosted on Elastic Cache. So basically, this was the first architecture we came up with, and we thought it was good enough to allow us to migrate. Moreover, we take this opportunity to bump some version of the packages up. In particular, PHP was migrated from 5.3 to 5.6, MySQL from 5.0 to 5.6, and we switch from Apache to Nginx and PHP FPM. Okay, so by doing that, we faced some problems. Um, in particular, when you were trying to switch from one Setup when basically you have only one machine, okay? In, 
because in the previous version of Rackspace, well, maybe there were more machines, but everything was shared. So we can treat them only as if we are only one machine. Here we have two machines, so we have different things to take care about. First one, web servers IP are dynamic because they are hosted on uh, Amazon and they change. We can connect only through a bastion and then we need to share user sessions between servers. The first one, web servers are dynamic, okay, but we can use uh, AWS SDK in, to get uh, a, descri a description of the servers and to filter that to get the IP. So uh, before every deploy, we just fetch the available servers, okay, which maybe is one, two, three, four, depending on uh, how many are uh, running based on the scaling policy, which I'll show you later. And basically we're done. So we get the IP and now we know where, on which server where we need to deploy. Okay, this is a snippet on, of how to do that with the SDK. In particular, here we are fetching uh, this group of servers, and here we are filtering the information, in particular, private IP address. Okay, makes sense? It should be, okay. <coughs> Please feel free, feel free to stop me and ask me a question if I'm not clear enough. Okay, we can connect only through Bastion host. What does it mean? Uh, as a security policy, basically we didn't give access, direct access to the production machine, so uh, a developer cannot SSH into the front-end server. But you need to uh, connect to another machine, which is called Bastionost, and this particular machine has the rights to connect to the front-end servers, which is okay from the security point of view, but it's not that good, and it can become complicated when you want to deploy new code. Uh, we solved that, adding a configuration on SSH. In particular, here we are saying, uh, Okay, that they want to connect to the bastion with this particular IP address, which is a fixed one, using this key, which is pretty simple. After that, here we are saying that if I want to connect to this pool of IP address, which are the IP of the front-end servers, we don't know exactly what they are, but they are in this range. If I want to connect to one of these IP, I need to proxy through the bastion. Okay, so basically, this is the meaning of all this configuration. With this configuration, we can just SSH through the front-end servers once we know, when we know the IP, and we're <coughs> done. We don't need to do anything else. Okay, last point, share user session. Um, actually, uh, talk was a stateless API, is a stateless API, so we, well, didn't deal with that at that particular moment of the migration. We'll be back on that later. Another thing we implemented was Nginx static cache. Basically, Nginx can create a static file, uh, after responding to a request and can serve this file instead of processing the request again, okay, okay. as uh, would another proxy cache do, like maybe varnish, okay? This is the configuration we used. In particular, this configuration is important. Fast GI cache key, basically, uh, all these different parameters and all the values, different values that each parameter can have, 
uh, make a key unique. So basically, here we are saying for every different value of scheme, request method, get, post, put, patch, for a different host name and for a different request query, cache a different version of the response. Okay. In that case, we also want to cache the response for three minutes, which is quite good. And another configuration was to exclude some particular method because, yeah, we don't want to cache post or put method, also delete. And we set this parameter, no cache equals to one, uh, and we are done. Another case for the talk API, this endpoint API queue is the moderation queue, okay, where the comments get posted and they wait to be moderated by an editor. Also, we don't want to cache this endpoint in order to show the editors always new comments okay, and non stale ones. What else? Okay. Here we are seeing that the no cache parameter is used to bypass the cache in this way. Okay. Uh, this is pretty standard, I guess. Uh, we deployed using the uh, same link trick. Let me call it that way. Okay. Basically, every deploy is done in a different directory, and then we have a symlink which is switched at the end of the deploy procedure in order to have automatic op cache uh, clear, cleared after each deploy. We use basically this parameter. We set document root to real path root, which means that symlink get resolved and when we deploy to a new directory and requests start arriving in the new directory, a new op cache is created. Again, so there is a little trick to uh, have op cache cleared automatically. Okay, so all the setup was done. We took the old logs, which uh, were available, not real time, but available, and we tried to find out which were the most hit endpoint and we start to load testing them. After that, we created MEI images, snapshot of the machine. We deployed the latest version of the code in the, on the new servers, and after that, we switched DNS. And we were done. More or less, actually, because <laughs> everything exploded. <laughs> and we found out that uh, the database we're missing a particular index that weren't present in the Rackspace database. And here the problem became, became quite obvious, obvious after like 10 seconds. So the idea of moving from a platform as a service to infrastructure as a service was good from that point of view. Okay. First part of the application was migrated. We were happy. Woohoo! Quick win. The platform now runs on two clouds, okay, Rackspace and AWS. Uh, two quick words about backup. Remember, this is our architecture, and we perform the backup of the front end machines and the database. We create uh, a snapshot every night, and we don't have a multi region setup, okay, all of this is in a single region. So if the region fail, uh, we are in, pro in trouble, but we just copy the snapshot to another region. So that was something we discussed with the client and we decided it was good enough as a starting point. Okay. How can we do that? Using the AWS uh, CLI API. Here is an example of how to create a snapshot of the database, okay? And how to copy it to another region in this way. RDS, copy DB snapshot. 
and then you specify the source and the target and the region, and you're done. After that, we clean the previously uh, created snapshot, and basically we're done. Okay, second application, ADV. Very quick, because it contains only a small database, really, really small. It's, again, stateless. All the infrastructure was already set. The migration was particularly easy. Uh, the only thing we did was to create a new platform distribution for dynamic content called adv.calturemarkato.com. Okay, in order to benefit from, again, HTTP caching. Done. No particular problems. Mobile. Okay, the mobile part of the site, uh, well, had a night impact because all, almost half of the traffic uh, ran through the mobile site. Now, this was when we started the migration. Today is uh, uh, higher. I think it's 55%. Of the total traffic runs through mobile. Uh, there is no database because it consumes data APIs from the other services. Uh, we need to face uh, a new problem: how to deal with static assets. Okay, when we deployed uh, the mobile site, we have static assets like background images and stuff like that. And in the previous version on Rackspace, everything was shared through NFS. We decided to use uh, the object storage from Amazon, Amazon S3, uh, defining a bucket in this way. And we created two cloud for distribution, again, one for dynamic content and one for static content, again, for uh, HTTP caching. And when we deploy a new version of the site, Using this command, we uh, sync the asset on S3. Okay, here we're saying just sync the data from this local folder directory to this bucket. And again, we are done. We deployed the mobile site on a sample machine in order to make some tests. Again, we using the logs, try to figure out what, where, which were the most uh, hit pages, and performance tested it. We deployed, rebuilt the MEI, and switched the DNS. And everything went smooth. Um, we measured, after the deploy, uh, things for a bit, like one week, two weeks, and we started to see that uh, there were a lot of requests from CloudFront, to S3. Uh, it turned out that we missed some uh, header, which can be added to um, every static asset in this way. Here, yeah, basically, we are saying, I add this cache control max age, like one hour, to all these assets, which is nice because this means less Request from CloudFront to S3, which means less dollars you spend on that. OK, again, still makes sense. OK, another part was community. As I said before, um, this site allows users to create their own personal blog. I can, I can write some posts, and people can comment and vote my post and stuff like that. And it's the first app that can be considered complete because it interacts with the database, it uses some APIs and stuff like that. Also, it exposes some APIs for user-related stuff like single sign-on or, yeah, allow to retrieving uh, user posts and stuff like that. So, the problem we skipped before popped back again. We need to share user session between servers. 
Uh, in this case, we used another service from Amazon, Amazon Elastic Cache, which is a MEM cache uh, as a service. You can use uh, without need to configure it on your own machine. We didn't have to make big changes in the code, just defining a new services, which is man cache, adding the different host, and change the session handler in this way. And automatically, all the sessions now are saved on, saved and retrieved on man cache, rather than the local file system. Yeah, exactly. OK. Uh, how to deal with user-generated content? Okay, we found a way to deal with the uh, static asset, and now we need to deal with uh, user-generated content, like posts and uh, uh, images and stuff like that. Again, we created, like before, two particularly cloud food distribution, one for dynamic content, called VXL, and one for static content, called C CDN VXL, both .com. Okay, in order to uh, work with uh, user-generated asset, we used GoFret, which is particularly, I guess, famous. How many of you, how many of you do you know GoFret? Few? Okay, it's a file system abstraction layer, which it means that it allows you, once you configure it, to write code in a file system independent way. Okay. It doesn't matter if I want to save a file on S3 or through FTP or in the local file system, the code remains the same. I just say, file system, write this content. And the library takes care of all the work needs to be done underneath to make it happen. Okay. Uh, another good library to do that is Fly System, if I remember the name correctly, from the PHP League. Um, also quite good. How do we configure GoFret in Symfony? You need to define adapters. An adapter, represent, an adapter represents basically, well, one file system you want to be able to uh, write a read to. In this case, we are saying, OK, this adapter is called photo storage, and it uses Amazon S3 which the bucket name defined in this parameter, and it uses this service ID. Then you define a file system called, again, the same way. Maybe it's not a really clever name, but here we are saying the photo storage file system who uses this adapter. And we can also call it in that way, photo storage file system. And the configuration is done. The client, the service we passed before in the configuration, is basically an S3 client, which we create uh, using, uh, well, yeah, AWS SDK. Here we are saying create, create an S3 client with this key, this secret in this region. Okay, the key and the secret are the one you get when you sign up for Amazon Web Services. The code to write and read assets is, as you can see, well, file system independent. Here we are saying this file system write on this path this content. And we don't know if underneath we are writing on the local file system or on S3 or on FTP, whatever. Okay. So this is the important part. And by the way, the photo uploader uh, class is the one we use to deal with uh, user-generated content when a user uploads his own images. Again, we deployed on the sample machine. We performance tested it based, again, on the logs. We deployed the new code, rebuild all the images, the MEIs, and we copy all the user assets on S3, and we switch 
Dennis. Okay. We are uh, at that point at two thirds of the migration. We migrated four services, two are left. The next one is web. Okay. Web was and is actually the oldest and biggest and biggest code base. Uh, Symfony one, really, really a lot of modules applications. And it's a proxy for all the mobile calls, API actually. And well, as I said before, now this percentage is a little lower, but still there is a lot of traffic running through that. First issues, well, officially, PHP 5.6 is not supported by Symfony 1. Okay? We came up with two plans, two different plans. First one, try to upgrade Symfony 1 to support PHP 5.6, and as a backup plan, deploy the web on different machines with an older PHP version. Uh, Fortunately, we found this project, which is basically a fork of the Symfony 1 repository, which is not maintained anymore. This one is actively, actively maintained, and uh, also there are new features. Uh, for instance, dependency injection container and um, Swift mailer as a default mailer. Uh, actually, we weren't interested in getting new features, so we just picked up the part of the code that enable us to make Symfony 1 PHP 5.6 compatible. It turned out that there were just basically one small uh, change. In particular, this function, prereg replace, doesn't allow this switch slash E anymore. And basically, this is the change you need to do to obtain the same behavior. And that's all. OK. After that, uh, we created another CloudFront distribution for starting content, cdmweb.calciumercato.com. And also, we switched DNS uh, using root 53 because, well, there is a detailed explanation on why we need to do that here. Uh, the idea is, uh, well, among the other things, uh, it gives us more flexibility in managing DNS in that particular way for this particular application. Uh, OK. What else? Nothing more, actually. Uh, we deployed again on a sample machine, performance tested, deployed like a kata, repeating the same action again and again and again, repeating the MEI, and then switch DNS. And web was migrated. The last part was uh, media, asset management, cropping, residing, stuff like that. Um, As I said before, handles, image, thumbnailing, stuff like that. Pretty big archive, 70 gigs. And yeah, API are stateful in that case, because in order to perform this operation, you need to be authenticated. Um, this is an example of how this part of the code works. Basically, the idea is when a, a site, mobile, web, or community, ask for an image through media. Media checks if a thumbnail already exists for that particular images, image, and if it exists, it serves directly. Otherwise, it creates it and uploads it to um, S3. Okay. Basically, what we do here is Let's say we are uh, serving a request for a new thumbnail. Download from File Manager. File Manager is the part of the uh, media API that contains the uh, images, original images. 
we generate a unique CDN key, we, res we resize the uh, image, we optimize it to save some space, then we upload it to the CDN, we update some metadata, after that we delete the temporary files, and basically we're done. So these are all the steps involved in creating a new thumbnail for a given image. Okay, we needed to transfer all the old images from the Rackspace CDN to S3. As I said before, the only access we got to Rackspace was through FTP, yay! So we wrote a nice script to copy all the images. Uh, well, it's basically a long, boring task, and sometimes Obviously, the script ang or the FTP, uh, the FTP connection drop. But after a few try, we made it, and we copied all the images on S3. And we found another little problem. In particular, uh, there is a little difference on how S3 can uh, manage image name. In particular, you need to um, remove all the strange characters, okay, which in the previous CDN was not a problem, but here it was. So with this snippet of code, we created a slug of the image name. And, uh, well, after that, everything went fine. Okay, so we migrated all the application. There are a few more things I'd like to discuss. And then if you have a question, I am available. Monitoring, yeah. Um, well, because we want to know when things go bad and in order to be able to react timely, we used Amazon CloudWatch to do that. Uh, in particular, we traced different uh, metrics like RDS CPU usage, uh, I.O. operation on the database again, the main cache dimension, request, and stuff like that, the number of requests on the uh, instances and the CPU usage, and stuff like that. Since uh, there is a two-week retention for this information, we have integrated it with our internal CACTI and Nagios monitoring tools in order to have a longer retention of this data. And also, we integrated it with Slack. So when something, some, sorry, something goes wrong, we are notifying directly on Slack. Auto-scaling. One of the nicer thing of using a Amazon Web Services is you can decide, based on some rules, when adding or removing more servers. Uh, for our use case, we have two auto-scaling group in our setup, and we defined three different metrics, CPU usage, response time, and number of requests per second. In particular, we decided that when the CPU usage goes over 70%, or where the response time goes over 100 milliseconds, or when the number of requests per second goes over 10,000, we spin up a new machine. And when the, these three metrics come back to normality, we just um, drop the extra machines. In this way, we can handle, uh, in a nice way, peaks during, let's say, January, August, September, and also peaks during big matches. Okay, there is mm, some few things I'd like to say. The full migration took us one year. Okay, actually it wasn't a full-time job, uh, because it was just a client of ours, but 
uh, yeah, it took one year of time, and it's something we did gradually, so we didn't want to rush things. We migrate one part, measure for one week, two weeks, how things were going, and then plan and migrate the other part of the application on the infrastructure, sorry. And after some measurements, we found that we have a 50% cost reduction for our particular case, which is, well, quite good. Mm, let me be clear, this talk is not about blaming Rackspace, okay? Simply, it wasn't suitable anymore for our needs, okay? Maybe it, it was fine when the project started, but at that particular scale, with our particular uh, needs, it wasn't suitable and suitable anymore. Okay, so this is the final architecture. Here we have uh, today normally two front-end web service for different um, availability zone, and again RDS, main cache. On top of that, a load balancer, and all the cloud phone distribution. DNS are managed through Route 53 and all the asset, both user-generated and static asset, are on S3. Uh, okay, what else? Macro services helped us a lot because, well, they were macro, but not big enough to, uh, not big as, let's say, web or community, and it allowed us to migrate in an incremental way, okay? If we, for instance, uh, add only a big monolith, well, probably it would have been much more difficult to migrate. Also, the HTTP cache helped us a lot, uh, giving us time in the beginning and helping us to saving money, reducing the number of requests, uh, from CloudFront to S3, but also from CloudFront to the front-end machine. Uh, it's important to try to measure uh, when you do changes to see if uh, your changes are having a good, a positive effect or a negative one. Uh, since the migration ended some months ago, we continued on that path and we well, started rationalizing the API calls, uh, trying to make less calls in general, okay? Uh, for instance, when loading comments uh, in the previous version of the site, four or five e requests were issued, if I remember correctly. Now we have only one. Uh, we reorganized some front-end stuff, uh, trying again to download less assets using Sprite and stuff like that. And we started to get rid of the old Symfony 1 application, um, trying to migrate it incrementally again in a Symfony 2 one. The next step are upgrading to PHP 7, which is something we actually already started to do. And after that, one thing we might want to try, because it's look, it looks promising, is switching the load balancer for, from ELB to ALB, uh, application load balancer, which supports um, several new features. One of these is HTTP2 support, which looks really, really promising from the performance point of view. Okay, I'm done. One last thing. If you want to join us uh, in Verona in May, this is Verona, there is a really, really nice conference, which is PHP Day. And the days before PHP Day, there is also the JavaScript Day. There are two community conferences, uh, international actually, so there are a lot of international speakers. Sorry. Sorry about that. And well, if you want to join us, it will be fun.
Again, thank you for listening. These are my uh, contacts. This is the um, talk on joined in. And if you have a question, I'm here. Thank you. Some question? Yeah. It sounds like the talk application was the one with the most volatile data, like users changing it, adding blogs, that kind of stuff. Was that the most difficult one to migrate because you couldn't control when comments were being added and things like that? How did you ensure that you, tran you, um, you switched over without losing data? How do I switch without losing data? Yeah, okay. the, the talk one in particular. Yeah, the talk one. Basically, when we started the migration, we put the, uh, the API in read-only mode. So for a short period of time, uh, people cannot post new comment, only read. And well, after the migration, we restored the uh, read-write mode, and basically, we were done. Also, we planned the migration in um, early in the morning, when the traffic is usually low. So we didn't experience a lot of problem. Still, some users got angry. Even if we put a message on all the sites, we are going to perform maintenance, but well, we didn't lose data. OK. Another question? Yeah? Uh, OK, thank, uh, so first, thank you for a great presentation. Thank you. Uh, and second, uh, you told that you are using CloudFront. And uh, yeah. in CloudFront, you are able to define uh, different origins, but also something called behaviors. That based on path, you are able to send the traffic to another origin. And uh, when you have two or three behaviors, it's quite easy. But when a uh, number of behaviors increases to, I don't know, 20 or more, uh, it's a hell to uh, deploy the changes. Uh, so my question is, do you have some ways of um, automate, automating uh, CloudFront deployment, CloudFront changes in CloudFront configuration? No. Uh, we have some of uh, those behaviors you are mentioning. Uh, for instance, for dealing with uh, some path on the mobile site. Um, but they are not that much. They, if I remember correctly, they are like four or five different behaviors. And no, we don't have a, an automatic way to, to change that or to, or to deploy that. OK. Other questions? OK. Thank you, everyone, for listening.